Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown of X-Men 97 Episode 6, Life Death Part 2. Class is in session with Charles Xavier, someone I never thought I would hear described as being from the ghetto. But we're gonna break down all the Marvel references and Easter eggs you might have missed in this episode. And the best way to support New Rockstars is to grab one of our X-Men inspired merch designs like this Storm Heed My Command shirt or our Gambit Remember It shirt, both available at nerdriot.shop. The opening title sequence has changed as usual, but perhaps what hits hardest is who is not here now, Storm of course is removed after episode two and now after last week's attack on Genosha Magneto is gone and so is Gambit remember it but Nightcrawler has been added since his return in Genosha in episode five now bearing twin sabers smoke trails lingering every time he bamps in and out of the brimstone dimension I'm not sure if I mentioned this before but starting with episode four the opening card of Jean Grey shifted from her hair being down to being back up in a ponytail now as for the first three episodes we were actually with Madeline Pryor instead of with Jean while these credits continue to put Sunspot in the Jubilee fence shot they still have not given him his own title card. Maybe his mean mom is the one editing this sequence and she's like, he doesn't deserve it. We once again see the shot of Cable and Apocalypse from season four, episode 18, Beyond Good and Evil part one, as we saw in the opening credits of last episode, despite this episode ending with the reveal of Sinister being behind the Bolivar Trask and Master Mold plan, Apocalypse still might be involved in some kind of time travel plot. Otherwise, I don't really know why they would keep showing him. Like there are so many other Cable shots that they could show. Why the one of him with Apocalypse involving the time cube from his arm that Cable showed last episode? There's a new shot of Nimrod standing in Master Mold's chest. We see Nimrod and Master Mold together in the season four, episode nine, One Man's Worth part two story, but not posed like this with him in his chest. So this has got to be a Bastion clue because Bastion is part Nimrod. Nimrod, of course, being an advanced Sentinel from the future and part Master Mold tech. And I believe we did see Bastion walking around the upper level when Magneto spotted him during the Genosha Gala last episode. So just so we're clear, I feel like there's like a conspiracy that includes Sinister along with Bastion and Bolivar Trask in Apocalypse, maybe with Mystique involved, if the thinking is correct, that she is disguised as Dr. Cooper on this season. Then a shot of Nimrod with his arms getting shot off. This is from season four, episode nine, One Man's Worth part two, in the alternate timeline where Storm and Wolverine are married and Bishop is helping them save a young Charles Xavier from being assassinated. We see these three badasses here with Storm's mohawk and cut off vest and Wolverine's dark suit with a skull belt buckle. As with episode four, there's also a shot of Forge with Wolverine and the X Factor that includes Lorna Dane cradling Havoc. And this is from season three, episode 11, Cold Comfort. Then a new shot of the X-Men fighting the Shi'ar Imperial Guard on the blue area of the moon, which is from the season three, episode 17, Dark Phoenix, part four, The Fate of the Phoenix. The Shi'ar wanted to execute Jean when she was possessed by the Phoenix, and the Kree Supreme Intelligence also appeared in this episode. And then another new shot of Charles and Lalandra meeting and touching hands for the first time from season three, episode four, The Phoenix Saga, part two, The Dark Shroud. After touching hands, they transition to a beautiful garden, which is from The Fate of the Phoenix episode. So this episode begins in space with the Shi'ar Empire in the green ships attacking the fleet of the Kree. They're they're the ones with blue ships with the chunky X extensions and the main body of the ships. Now in the MCU, we have met the imperialistic forces of the Kree Empire, which is the society where Carol Danvers spent some time headquartered on the planet Hala, which of course factored into the Dar Ben plot in the 2023 film, The Marvels. Opposed to the Kree are the Skrull race of shapeshifters. So in general, on the cosmic front, there's also the Xandarians from the Guardians of the Galaxy films headquartered on Xandar with the Nova Corps. And so the Shi'ar is another race that so far has just been explored on the X-Men animated series, as well as the comics, of course, and fun in fact, Jessica Chastain's character in Dark Phoenix was originally going to be Lalandra from the Shi'ar Empire, but was later changed to the Dabari named Vuk. So we see the Kree activating this cannon from their warship that seems to magnetize a few fighters together, pushing them back and then blowing them up together. And then Deathbird dive bombs onto the bridge of this Kree warship. So Deathbird is Lalandra's sister. And the last time we saw her, she made a deal with Apocalypse to bring him Oracle in exchange for Apocalypse's help, taking the throne from Lalandra. But that doesn't seem to be the case now. In the end of that, Apocalypse did just abandon in her. This was Beyond Good and Evil Part 2, The Promise of Apocalypse. This was when Apocalypse was kidnapping the most powerful psychics in the world, and I wonder if he might still be doing that, because all the psychics on this show seem to be linked, right? Now, it initially seems like Deathbird is back to serving Lalandra as she's working alongside the Imperial Guard once more, but it is clear by the end of this episode that Deathbird's actions are really to establish herself as just a strong, loyal military commander within the ranks of the Shi'ar regime, as she's actually trying to replace her sister and paint her as disloyal for controversially marrying a Terran. We also see the Kree leader Ronan the Accuser, who also appeared in the MCU, of course, and he carries his Cosmi Rod, and it has this, you know, angular five-sided shape like it had in the MCU. He says, This pigeon shall not thwart the will of the supreme intelligence. 
pigeon. Now the Shi'ar are a bird themed culture and I love how Ronan insults her with the lowest status bird, at least lowest status other than seagulls. A death bird's mission is to find the location of the Kree Supreme Intelligence, which of course is the Kree AI hive mind containing their greatest thought leaders and scholars from throughout their history. Remember in the Marvels, Carol Danvers destroyed the Kree Supreme Intelligence, earning her the name the Annihilator. And here at New Rockstars, we now call her a war criminal. But in the 90s X-Men run, we saw the Kree Supreme Intelligence. Lilandra had to confer with it and the Empress of the Scrolls to get the approval for the Imperial Guard to duel the X-Men. At the time, it seems like the Kree and the Scrolls and the Shi'ar had a respectful relationship, but it clearly some point between then and now, the Supreme Intelligence fled. Deathbird commands the Imperial Guard that we saw in past space set episodes like the Fate of the Phoenix arc, as well as the Star Jammers episode. And this team includes Earthquake and then Vulcan. Vulcan is the brother of Cyclops and Havoc, born to the Shi'ar Empire. Cyclops' father was Corsair, so that's why he has a brother who's born somewhere out in space. We also meet Gladiator, and then Manta, Smasher, Titan, Starbolt, and Flashfire. It is a bit silly that Deathbird is wearing stiletto boots, but the animators totally own this by having Deathbird stomp on Ronan's face and the heel stabbing into his cheek, drawing blood. Um... This better not awaken anything in me. Empress Lelantra appears in the form of a hollow globe, and at first seems like it's just a personal call to her sister, but it's actually an address to the entire Shi'ar Empire, which you know has got to piss off Deathbird. Lelantra says that it was one year ago when she took in Charles Xavier after he was put in a coma, telling us that it has been exactly one year since the events of the 90s run finale, season five, episode 10, Graduation Day. Lelandra reminds us of her and Charles' past relationship, how Charles helped save the universe from madness of her brother Dickhen, as well as the Phoenix, which we saw in the season three Phoenix Saga storyline, as well as in season three, episode 18, Orphans End. Charles and Lelandra share a psychic bond and met when she was fleeing from her brother Dickhen, who had gone mad with his desire to attain the Imkron crystal. Lelandra reached out to Charles first psychically, almost breaking his damn brain. Among the audience listening to the speech are miners with pickaxes that resemble horses of earth. At first I wondered that these might be Corbinites, but Corbinites snouts don't look exactly like this. I'm thinking that they are Camellians, who we see in the Power Packs comics. And among this crowd, we actually do see a Dabari, which as I said, is the same alien race that we ended up seeing in 2019 Dark Phoenix. And then this guy might be a Balurian there in the background. Lelandra declares about Charles. This man has unlocked the secrets to my heart. <laughs> and I love this moment. You see Araki grunting in disapproval. He's the Empire's Chancellor and part of the Empress's Council. Charles steps forward, given this new bionic suit to help him walk. And only when he removes his helmet to unveil the bald head, unlike the goofy hair most of the Shi'ar have, the crowd loses their minds with murmurs. Murmur. Now, Charles back on Earth was reported to be dead in the opening episodes of the season, but is clearly still alive. It remains a mystery why the X-Men, knowing that Charles had gone off with Lalandra, an advanced alien race, would then purport this narrative of Charles's death and allow Charles's last will and testament to take legal effect and hand over management of the team to Magneto. But clearly there was some understanding between Charles and the rest of them, maybe to put out this noble lie in order to unite humanity against the bigotry of Henry Peter Gyrick by turning Charles into a martyr. But at the same time, clearly Magneto's leadership and self-segregation of mutant kind into a single location of Genosha, where any anti-mutant force could attack thousands of them in one night, wasn't that great for mutant kind either. I know Charles respects Magnus, I just don't know why he would make it part of his plan to entrust the leadership of the X-Men to Magneto in his absence. I assume we'll find that out next episode. Charles and Lelandra stroll through the gardens of the Shi'ar throne world of Chandelar, and working in these gardens is that same Equin race, which just shows that between gardening and mining, the Shi'ar have subjugated this race to do physical labor. They're literal workhorses. That's not cool, Charles says. I pray our act of performative jingoism erased any concerns over my heritage. Charles is referring to the joint hand salute that you see presidential candidates and their running mates do, shouting for the Imperium, which for whatever reason reminded me of when Patrick Stewart played Gurney Halleck in David Lynch's Dune. In the season three, episode 17, Fate of the Phoenix storyline, Charles and Lelandra shared a psychic paradise, but their romance was spoiled over trying to contain the Phoenix, which she felt would be manipulative. I wish only to cherish you, Charles. Then help me. Join with me to contain the phoenix. That was unworthy of you. And this kind of exchange gets called back this episode. Perhaps an empress could even spend a portion of her time ruling the galaxy from my little corner of it? My handsome emperor has much to learn about masking his manipulations. As they walk, you can see other members of the court watching them and whispering, probably saying some bigoted shit about Charles. Lelandra asks why Charles wants to visit his family. Families often mimic black holes visit and risk being stuck in its ever-spiraling vacuum of dramas. 
<laughs> Yikes. Someone who works on the show really hates visiting their hometown because this is one of the most tenuous analogies I've ever heard. Lelandra tells Charles that after they crush the Kree, he can be the educator who teaches them their ways. And already we're seeing how she misunderstands education as indoctrination. As empress of an imperialistic society, she thinks the role of education is to enforce the conqueror's values onto the conquered. When in reality, true education is to practice critical thinking, to open one's mind, and to challenge oneself with various schools of thought. Lelandra says, the virtue of a teacher lies in showing their students how to walk on their own. And there is some irony there, as the Shi'ar only cured Charles's inability to walk by giving him a mechanical suit. So he's kind of like the roadie of the MCU. But really, they just applied a suit of armor band-aid over the issue without doing anything to cure him internally. Like, technically, the MCU Wakandans have better medical technology than the Shi'ar do, which tells you something about their resource priorities. Or who knows? They're evolved from birds. Maybe they just all have hollow bird bones and they don't know how to cure simian-evolved bones. Then we see this creature that looks like a firefly soaring past their two moons. And on the shot, we crust dissolve to rural Texas where once again an owl flies past the moon and in Life Death Part 1 we learn that this owl was actually the adversary watching Storm and Forge. The adversary from the rafters creeps over Storm as she cares for Forge as the adversary's attack on Forge's shoulder left him poisoned. As before the adversary is voiced by Allison Seeley Smith who also voices Storm suggesting that the adversary is a demonic force who can occupy the mind of any character and speak to them in their own voice. The adversary traps Storm in a wooden coffin which is particularly triggering for Storm's claustrophobia. She stammers that she does not fear death but the adversary knows that, dragging her into her most fearful living scenario. She mocks the moment in episode two when Storm told Jean in that bedroom that she wondered what it would be like to be human. Is that why you fear your power sought refuge with this monotone family? Now, Storm was one of the only people of color on the X-Men, so without her, they really are mostly monotone. Like, Jubilee is on the team, sure, but this episode doesn't even put Roberto in the opening credits. What does that tell you? The adversary shoves its face through the lid of the coffin, taking the form of Jean or Madeline since the hair is down, and then Beast, and then Wolverine, then Rogue, then Gambit and then Cyclops, but notice how the eyes always glow red and their mouths are always wrinkled and banged. Forge comes to the rescue. Lord of Chaos! <laughs> Weaver of lies! I tear your thread and break your loom! Depart to the desert, demon! Depart! and be gone. Forge is a wizard. The look of the magic that Forge wields looks like the Eldritch magic used by Doctor Strange and the Sorcerers of Kamartaj in the MCU. I'm not sure if the similarity is intentional or just inspired, but I wonder if Forge's mother might have received training from the same source. But we should note that the symbols within those golden rings, especially visible when they break apart, are different. It looks like Forge's mother may have adapted her education to the culture that she grew up in, which would be the Cheyenne Nation. By the way, I just love that each chunk of magic drops down like a physical spark, reminding me of how in the MCU, you, Dr. Strange's sparks often bounce off the surfaces of the physical world. Thank you to BetterHelp for sponsoring this video. Being healthy means more than just eating well and going to the gym. It means being mentally healthy too. Just like you might need a trainer to help you with your gym routine, you might need a therapist to help you with your mental health. And BetterHelp can help you find one that is right for you. BetterHelp makes starting therapy easier and less intimidating for a lot of people. First, use our link to go to their site, betterhelp.com slash new rockstars. The site will ask you to answer a few questions so BetterHelp can match you to an experienced professional who specializes in whatever you're struggling with. You can do it all from your phone or computer via phone call, video chat, or messaging, however you feel most comfortable. It's the easiest possible way to start talking to a therapist. You'll be matched to a therapist usually within 48 hours, so you can get started fast. We've been promoting BetterHelp for a while, and we've heard some amazing feedback from you guys. We got permission to share this review from one of our viewers who said, quote, I used to be against the idea of therapy and didn't need it. After one session with my therapist, I completely pivoted and realized how beneficial therapy truly is is. Let BetterHelp connect you to a therapist who can support you, all from the comfort of your own home. Visit BetterHelp.com slash New Rockstars or choose New Rockstars during sign up and enjoy a special discount on your first month. Forge tells Storm about a healing cactus, the Midnight Chala that grows in caves. They decide to ride together and the lovebirds transition to actual lovebirds back on Chandelar. Charles is introduced as Lalanja's royal consort. Your man speaks as if I am your pet. Hmm. Not an entirely displeasing thought. Hush now, beloved. You may bark later. Woof! This show is so kinky. Araki tries to put it delicately that Landra marrying a Terran isn't necessarily popular, but her sister Deathbird is blunt. Your consort was born on the wrong side of the stars. He is Terran. Wrong side of the stars, obviously. Wrong side of the tracks. Either way, oof. Charles says, I respect you speaking the quiet part out loud, Deathbird. So let's speak plainly. 
<laughs> okay, so Charles is using the social media meme of saying the quiet part loud, which basically just refers to anytime you call out public figures who are just openly showing their racist agendas, like beyond dog whistling to just like straight up whistling in your ear their racism. But I looked into this and it sounds like this term might have originated from The Simpsons. Oops, I said the quiet part loud and the loud part quiet. But Deathbird continues with this bigotry. Xavier would see his Milky Way ghetto become our new throne world. So Deathberg invokes the right of Imdasha, which requires a test of loyalty in order to wed a royal, and Charles says he already read this volume the second day he was here, but Deathbird can choose any loyalty test that she wants, and she declares Charles must erase all of his memories of Earth and Alondra to be the one to do it. Speaking of Doctor Strange parallels, this is essentially the Runes of Cough Call memory spell that Peter Parker requests Doctor Strange place upon the world to make everyone forget that he's Spider-Man and No Way Home. So Charles looks at these Shi'ar statues, which Gladiator says depicts Shara and Kithri, their highest gods, who married for the sake of harmony, and Gladiator seems to take offense to Charles's dig that the Shi'ar consider art to be a form of insanity, but he says that they don't put up these statues as art, which, if you think about it, by definition, can be interpreted in different ways, but really as political symbols that he says can be interpreted in one and only one way, and he says that is that Shi'ar values is merging all into one, and that that oneness and sameness brings about peace. But that imperialism is basically assimilation, forcing all cultures to merge into one just for peace? He's clearly misinterpreting what these gods were probably really doing, not realizing that forced assimilation robs the universe of diversity of thought and of culture. Rather than insult Gladiator though, notice how Charles just quips something he wouldn't understand as someone who doesn't know any artist or poet. How Rudyard Kipling of you. So Rudyard Kipling is the English writer who lived in British India and wrote The Jungle Book, among a number of other writings, including the poem White Man's Burden, which famously critiqued Western imperialism during the Victorian era. How arrogant the British Empire was to assume it had the burden to impose white cultural values to civilize a diverse world. And Charles tries to explain this concept using the term burden, but Gladiator just responds saying that idealism is also a sign of insanity. Basically, everything is a form of insanity to the Shi'ar. Any kind of free thought is insanity. It's because they are bird Brain. Birds of a feather flock together, and that includes racism. Charles references his friend Magnus, who would agree with Gladiator, but think about it, in Magneto's case, the values he would impose are those of mutant kind, and we do actually get to see Magnus's dream of a mutant-dominated society in the House of M storyline. Well, Lanjar asked Charles why he would want to remember a society that was so intolerant and so cruel to him, and it's kind of an interesting debate that I think parallels the debate over therapy. Like, why re-trigger yourself by remembering past traumas if you can just allow your mind to naturally black out memories that no longer serve you? Charles ultimately just decides this episode that those things still happen to you and that pain leaves a physical mark whether you address it or not and you'll never fully heal yourself if you try to redact your past and ignore things that happened to you. Forge and Storm ride to Snow Snake Tower and inside this cave they pass these ball cartridges from 1863 which Forge explains. Union forces stored weapons here during the Civil War it was actually built during the Plains War decades earlier by colonists. They said that they were here to help. The Plains War refers to a series of conflicts between U.S. federal forces and Plains Indians that really heated up during the 1850s. So in this episode that criticizes imperialism as a concept, we get another example of how imperialism and manifest destiny shaped the United States. Storm believes that she might be better this way as a non-mutant, since the more people she saved with her mutant powers, the more anti-mutant bias she incited. But Forge says, Growing up, I always heard how the worst weapon used by the Europeans was not bullets or blankets, but a white lie that they could make us <clears throat> Yeah, he's gonna say, make us believe. So the term white lie originates in the English language back to the 1400s, but in more recent cultural criticism, it has taken on an additional context of the lies white settlers told to indigenous tribes in the Americas to steal their land. Forge points away forward for Storm, a cramped mine shaft, and we get a dolly zoom for Storm as her claustrophobia kicks in. Meanwhile, Araki and Lalandra put Charles through the right of Imdasha, and Charles is prepared to renounce his life on Earth, but when it comes to the X-Men in particular, Charles hesitates. Even that hesitation, Deathbird reacts to, probably considering hesitation a form of insanity. Deathbird pushes past the guards, unperturbed by their spears, and Deathbird now just lets the quiet part be real loud. How can we entrust our mighty empire to a ruler descended of simians, have our blood mixed with his inferior freak fluids? How is being evolved from apes any better or worse than being evolved from erds if on your celestial timeline, you still become, you know, sentient humanoids. Also notice how her eyes totally widened on the word mix. A council member says that Charles isn't even a pure Terran, saying that mutants represent a lower caste. And that is wild. Why do they care about the class warfare happening on Earth? Genetically, mutants are still humans. And if anything, an evolutionary scientist would see them as more evolved because evolution occurs by mutations that make a species better adapted to its environment. A fight breaks out between the sisters' forces and Gladiator, to his credit, continues to serve a over Deathbird, but Charles remembers his greatest gift. Hear me, 
Class is now in session. <laughs> And Charles takes them into the astral plane. And I love that he commits to the classroom setting so hard that he has more desks than attendees. Like he's leaving some spots open for anybody else who might want to come to class. Meanwhile, Storm crawls through the mine shaft and spotting the cactus, she climbs higher and higher in a shaft that narrows and narrows until she drops her flashlight. And the only light comes from the adversary's eyes, whose head menacingly rotates closer and closer, showing her spiraling. And the walls now physically close in, but it's probably an illusion by the adversary. The screen goes black. And then Storm realizes that it wasn't just Executioner's gun that depowered her, it was her belief in the lie, the white lie that Forge referred to earlier, and this Omega level mutant allowed that lie to define her reality, and she doesn't need to continue doing that. And the Newton Brothers music kicks in. So let them thunder, for I am lightning! This is the same awesome music that we heard back in episode one when Storm brought the forecast in the desert. The bolts of lightning explode the adversary into a puff of feathers and Storm transforms. We see her clear the clouds above and those clouds up into the upper stratosphere form an upward spiral. So she went from spiraling down in the earth deeper and deeper to taking that same spiral and inverting it going higher and higher into space. And the black feathers molt away to produce a new black suit. This is Storm's Pride of the X-Men look, her original 1975 look when she debuted in Giant Size X-Men number one. So I just have to wonder, if the adversary led Storm to be able to clear her own mental blocks and restore her powers, did it arguably help her? Do our demons help us by making us stronger? Is that why we have demons? Is this inner bird connected to the Phoenix, which I believe is currently helping Jean Grey and Madeline Pryor? Because this episode includes the satellite view of Earth from space, and Charles has the globe on his desk in the astral plane, and I feel like we just saw a path formed opening for these two different different cosmic birds to help the X-Men reunite. I don't know, maybe I'm just reading into it. Maybe that's just me. Storm goes on this victory flight and it feels so great. She freaks out some horses and then through a canyon, she checks out her new look in a reflection, which totally feels like Spielberg's shot in Peter Pan's victory flight and hook when Peter cleared his mental block and found his happy place. You remember? Da, 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 da. But then she turns this river water into three cyclones just so she can get a look at her own reflection in the vertical water wall when her hair is dropped down from gravity. When healing forge, Storm says, what are demons but reflections of our fears and shame? Oh. Things we bury within us, hide from loved ones, even as they poison our hearts. Until we finally heal our adversary by embracing it. What are demons, but it's the same kind of semantic structure as what is grief, if not love persevering. Using the same structure, what is hunger, but an absence of Chipotle. Just as Charles invited Lalandra to do, Forge invites Storm to whisk away to a tropical island, but they see Trish's TV broadcast on the Genosha massacre, which she says could be the first salvo in the evolutionary war. Charles lectures the Shi'ar in the astral plane classroom, saying their power comes from the harvest of skulls that were they allowed to grow would match them in power. So they cut them off at the kneecaps, but by assuming it's a zero-sum game, they're depriving themselves of friendly societies that would help them solve their own problems. And I love how Charles uses this nifty chalkboard animation, which reminds me of a very similar expositional sequence in FX's Legion, in which the character of Legion was the son of Charles Xavier. So Charles says that these assumptions of competition and possession are not natural. We are not born with them. They are made up artificial inventions by society. And he says coexistence may be messy and living in complex worlds is indeed confusing, but the solution is not inevitable conflict, it's education. It's it's sharing of knowledge. It's applying critical thinking to solve problems. He says that they are all children of the atom, which is just interesting because they are all descended from the Big Bang, an original giant dense atom that split. But this phrase, children of the atom, is associated with the X-Men and mutants, which comes from a 1953 Wilmar Shiras novel about orphan kids whose parents were exposed to radiation, and those kids were known as super smart gifted mutants. And when Stan Lee and Jack Kirby originally conceived of the X-Men in 1961, before Stan said that they were born with powers, one idea might have been to have their powers come from radiation during the nuclear age. You may remember Sebastian Shaw using the phrase in X-Men First Class. We are the children of the atom. Radiation gave birth to mutants. What will kill the humans will only make us stronger. But the astral plane is intruded by another vision as Charles's classroom desks are now filled with skeletons, way more skeletons than there were Shi'ar students a moment before. Charles is now back in a nightmarish version of Xavier's Institute and towering over it is Gambit, who also turns into a skeleton. Now I have to ask, why would he see Gambit and not the corpse of Magnus, someone he was closer to? Does this mean Magneto survived? Could Leech have somehow negated the blast from the Wild Sentinel? Who knows? But Charles screams, No! They were dancing, drinking wine, making love! 
Oh, my children, my children of the atom! Charles, were you watching Rogue and Magneto hooking up? Mm. Skeleton Gambit releases a green blast from its mouth like the Wild Sentinel, and Charles's flesh melts off his bones like Sarah Connor in the Blast in Terminator 2. And he tells Lalandra, f this marriage, I gotta go back to Earth. So we gotta ask who gave Charles this vision? It might be a force for good to reunite Charles with the X-Men. I think it's the same metaphorical psychic force that gave the visions to Jean Grey and to Madeline Pryor in episode five. And I think it is the Phoenix Force, helping preserve Madeline and Jean and mutant kind into the future. We end the episode with Bolivar Trask fleeing Mr. Sinister. He says, I did what you asked. I gave you my DNA to access Master Mold. You'll notice War of the Worlds is playing on the cinema marquee, and Sinister says it's the beginning of a prologue, and he ends the episode laughing. So it seems like they're saying Sinister was behind the wild sentinel attack on Genosha. I think he's clearly part of the attack, but I don't think he's operating alone, because it would not serve Sinister's agenda of mutant experimentation and advancement to massacre a million mutants. Based on the clues for Apocalypse and Bastion via Nimrod in the opening sequence, I think Sinister is in league with Apocalypse to help him bring about a future mutant utopia by first wiping out the present day mutant masses, and then, maybe through Cable, breeding a new pure strain of mutant kind. But I want to hear from you. Let me know your theories in the comments below. You can follow me at EA Voss. Big thanks to Gina Ippolito and Brandon Barrick for helping me research and write this breakdown. Subscribe to all three channels in the New Rockstars Network. New Rockstars, The Break Room, and The Deep Dive. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye.